A journal entry penned by a Harvard Law School professor has sparked outrage among the academic community and civil society, as the writing defamed the thousands of victims forced into serving sex for the Japanese military in the, 19th, in the 20th century, deeming them voluntary prostitutes. The piece authored by J. Mark Ramsayer, a professor of Japanese legal studies, says Korean women and girls trafficked into the program had not been coerced but were working under rather generous contractual contractual terms. This clearly contradicts clear evidence of Japan's systematic abuses collected over the years as well as personal testimonies from the victims. Legal experts and academics in the US and South Korea have condemned the so-called article and civil society has called for its removal from the journal as well as referral of the case to the International Court of Justice. Ramsey not only invited strong criticism but also questions as to why he made such ungrounded claims. We discussed this today with Pyongyang Min, Distinguished Professor of Sociology at Queen's College and Graduate Centre of the City University of New York. We're also joined by Alexis Studden, Professor of History at the University of Connecticut. A very warm welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining the programme. Well, let's go straight into this discussion, starting with you, Dr Min. Well, having read this uh, so-called article, what was really unsettling about Ramsey's piece was the way he reduced this issue of sexual enslavement to a rather trivial human resources management problem. He claims that the victims of sex slavery were voluntarily working as prostitutes and had contracts. He, in, doing, in portraying them as a disgruntled group of workers trying to raise their salary, it was like he was calling victims of robbery active sponsor of, sponsors of street crime. I mean, but then please enlighten us, what was the reality? Please, uh, why was this really a case of enslavement? Um, well, uh, this, it is uh, 30 years since the uh, Red Dress Movement started. And uh, during that period, uh, uh, we have a uh, uh, larger number of studies that have uh, persuasively demonstrated that the uh, complement system was a uh, uh, sexual slavery. Uh, many Japanese scholars uh, used the uh, Japanese military document indicating uh, Japanese military uh, planned and established campus station and they controlled the management and uh, moved women from one place to another and uh, they actually a controlled uh, recruiting uh, company. Uh, not only that, many international human rights organizations, uh, including UN Commission on Human Rights, they have uh, invited uh, eminent uh, international uh, law scholars and made the investigation and uh, they made this same conclusion, it was a, a sexual slavery and uh, about 25 resolutions they have sent to the Japanese government to uh, resolve the problem uh, by uh, acknowledging sexual slavery and making sincere apology and compensation uh, to the women. Japanese government hasn't done anything uh, so far. Um, and then in 2000, uh, they had uh, uh, international women's uh, uh, women's uh, uh, military court uh, held uh, in uh, Tokyo, and uh, uh, they had a uh, decisive judgment. Uh, this is uh, uh, se sexual slavery and uh, uh, it's a crime against uh, humanity. So right now, we don't need to have a discussion. You know, it's a common sense knowledge. It was a uh, sexual slavery. Right, and Val Ramsey, he was arguing with common sense knowledge here, as you said, sir. And of course, you've written a response to this as well, also outlining how it's wrong to group 
Japanese comfort women and Korean comfort women together. And well, now go, um, to bring you into the conversation, Dr. Dudden, now one thing that Ramsey and most historians could perhaps agree on is that wherever the Japanese Imperial Army went, they is established these comfort women stations. And comfort women, of course, is a euphemism to describe the women and girls tricked and forced into serving sex for the Japanese military personnel during World War II. And this wartime enslavement of women was unfortunately made very systematic in Korea and Japan, but it also expanded to other countries as well. How far reaching was this program? Thank you for your question and also for the chance to speak with Dr. Min as well. Uh, it was a, it was empire wide. The, uh, the stations ranged from northern Japan, Hokkaido, actually even some islands uh, further north, all the way down into Rabaul, into Papua New Guinea, uh, in, throughout Indonesia, uh, what we call Myanmar today, up through North China. And I think on the one hand, I do agree with Professor Min saying we need to consider Korean victims separately from Japanese. Yes, there were the preponderance of victims came from Korea. At the same time, one of the most important developments since 2000, since the Women's Tribunal in Tokyo, which I attended and was really quite fascinating. Since then, survivors themselves have said it's less important to concentrate on their place of origin and more important to concentrate on the shared uh, conditions of their victimization. And this is really important. And what we can take from this effort, when you look, for example, in 2017, when Halmoni Gilvon Ok traveled to Berlin to meet with a contemporary survivor of an ISIS rape camp, it's important to understand that the survivors um, have transformed this issue from an us versus them uh, battle uh, that it really, you know, it, it has that dimension. Everybody's pressuring Japan but rather the victims themselves, the survivors themselves say, no, we shared this horror together, including the first exam the first victims of this crime who were Japanese women. And, and so it's really, it's important to understand as, as Professor Min so eloquently said, you know, this is a crime against humanity determined by uh, the United Nations, by Amnesty International, uh, and, and as such, their collectivity, everybody, uh, is we listen to the survivors to learn from them the conditions of their horror. And with that, we hope to be able to prevent or predict and even stop instances in the present. And I think that's, to me, the most damaging part of yeah. Professor Ramsayer's published article which is that he wants to drag us back, uh, or the article and its supporters want to drag us all back into fighting Korea versus Japan, which is not only unproductive, but not where the scholarship is, but most important, not where the few remaining survivors are. Right. And I think that to me is most upsetting. Right, and this was very much acknowledged as a universal human rights problem, not an us versus them problem. And I personally had the honor of meeting a lot of compassionate Japanese people who are fighting to remove this problem from contemporary society as well. Women and children being trafficked mostly for sexual exploitation, which is why uh, Dr. Min, this very flippant nature of Ramsey's words, they were very shocking, deeply upsetting. He turned this rather horrific human rights abuses into an object with, of mockery with crude attempts at humour with his words. He said, not all, if all, um, not all, if not most women, were not forced to work as prostitutes. And he said that they even travelled to Taiwan for work as though it had been some kind of work abroad scheme for university students. Then, of course, he talks about how much Korean women didn't earn as much as Japanese women did as they were not as popular. So not only do all these words dishonour the estimated 200,000 women in Korea, China, Vietnam, Myanmar, and even Australia, other parts of Asia, who were kidnapped and forced into serving the Japanese Imperial Army, it also ridicules women today who are trafficked into sex, tormented mentally as well as physically, and can't find a way out. What does his article really mean from a human rights perspective, Dr. Min? Uh, well, 
I think uh, uh, when I talk about the difference between Korean and Japanese comfort women, I am not saying Japanese women are uh, not sexual slaves, but because uh, Korean women, 93% of Korean women were mobilized uh, before age 21. So that's a legal age for prostitution. Uh, um, but most of Japanese women were mobilized 21 and after. And Lamjia, uh, you know, put these two groups together, and that's, that makes no sense. Definitely, uh, this is a, a huge uh, human rights violation issue, and that's why all over the world, uh, many students, uh, human rights activists, feminists, and politicians joined the movement because uh, same thing should not they believe same thing should not happen again in the future and dr dodden now why do you think ramsay published this kind of very inflammatory piece at this time in particular what kind of academic merit was he trying to present with this I actually can't answer that million dollar question. And that's something that we can look at in the future by piecing together how this publication came about. How was it placed? And, and many researchers are looking at uh, a number of Professor Ramsayer's articles to notice patterns. And that's really what scholarly analysis is, right? I mean, this isn't, there's, an opinion piece and anybody is in a constitutional democracy academic freedom freedom of expression these are core values that must be upheld so an opinion piece is an opinion piece this holds two for academic inquiry and publication but not if you're making up your sources not if you're making up evidence or just there's no evidence so if i could tie that to your your question just prior to dr min's what does this say about human rights um, it says in this article that this article and its author don't care about human rights law. And that's, that's troubling because what does that say about the view in Japan? And I'm glad, I'm, I'm grateful for you to raise the Japanese voices that are, don't share this worldview. And I would say this is, you know, a point of division in Japanese society. And it's important to recognize that, you know, there are a number of touchstones in many societies around the world today that divide societies. This particular topic divides Japanese society. So the group that favors the view espoused in Professor Ramsayer's article would deny core universalisms that have engaged Japan to world society since 1945. It's a powerful view. It's a retrograde view. It happens to be the view in power. So that may help researchers figure out how this article came into print. I don't know. But equally, there are the same number of voices are trying to counter this view in Japan and hold on to Japan's positive place in the world as a leader to prevent the trafficking of minors. And I think I also appreciate your raising that term because so many times we refer to how many we refer to women, but we're also talking about children. We are talking about the legal category of a minor. And so it doesn't matter what kind of analysis from a baseline, this is illegal. It was illegal in Japan at the time it took place. It is illegal today. And it needs to be addressed through that lens that this is a deceptive ruse to try to cover a uh, what happened. And uh, it's just, it's shameful, actually. Uh, and it disgraces people who espouse Japan's universal place in the world. So this piece by Ramsey really, really um, shows how much we need to move forward and not look back as this piece of work can't even call it an article, um, tries to do the opposite. And while well, the, uh, the journal that it was um, supposed to be 
published in uh, said that it would review the situation and it's going to delay the printing of the publication but it is still very much a part of their final edition so we will have to wait and see how um, things proceed from now but well this is where we're going to have to end the discussion today um, that was Dr. Min pyong and Dr. Alexis Studden joining us from New York and Connecticut. Thank you both so very much for your time today. Thank you. And to our viewers, as always, thank you very much for watching.